Good evening. I'm Donna Wares, editor of the LA Times Book Club. Welcome back. As you know, this is our very first in-person LA Times Book Club event since February 2020. And I want to thank everyone here at LA Live for getting off the couch, actually putting on some pants, and joining us for a cocktail. We are so excited to pretend present two very special guests who grew up on television right in front of all of us on some of the most iconic and popular shows of the 1960s and 1970s. I could really uh, spend a long time telling you all about Academy Award winner Ron Howard, the red-headed boy who famously played Opie, and about his kid brother Clint, an actor with more than 250 screen credits um, and very memorably starring opposite a brown bear named Gentle Ben. But really, I'd rather show you. And our guests tonight have made that so easy by producing a beautiful video about the backstory of their new book, The Boys. <laughs> I have been fortunate to see my life turn out incredibly well, to not only realize, but surpass my dreams of making a living as a storyteller. It could have all been so different. My name could easily have been Ronnie Beckenholt, and today I would be, what? How about a farmer in North Central Oklahoma where my dad's folks were from? It's long hours and hard work, but fortunately, I have the company of my brother Clint, five years my junior. Ron talks in positive terms. He's a glass half full guy. I'm not sure I would have handled those harsh Oklahoma winters particularly well. There's a good chance I might still have become a familiar face as a young man to the Oklahoma State Troopers. It's true that we didn't become farmers, but we inherited the farmer's work ethic our folks brought with them from Oklahoma. Until recently, I was not particularly inclined to contemplate the why of this. But when my father died over Thanksgiving weekend in 2017, his passing kicked off a round of introspection. Clint and I were now orphans. Our mother had died in 2000. Our parents' story had come to an end, a lot for us to process. Their journeys were rich and strange in ways we hadn't realized until that point. That made our journeys rich and strange, too. Like Ron, I experienced a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions the day we went back to our old house after our pop died. I don't know if I'd even be here right now if it weren't for Dad. Then, as now, Hollywood was littered with cautionary tales. We grew up in circumstances that were profoundly unusual. Dividing our time between attending public schools, being tutored on set, and working in an industry fraught with way more snares and traps than we were aware of in our innocence. Yeah, I guess we were different. We were grinders and scrappers. Showbiz may seem glamorous, but each battle is one in the trenches with heavy doses of perspiration and preparation. Mom and Dad managed this feat with remarkable grace navigating their boys through terrain that by all rights should have left us psychologically damaged. But like Indiana Jones in that famous scene where he narrowly escapes getting crushed by a giant rolling boulder, we somehow made it through intact, ready for the next adventure. Ron and I decided to share our story of growing up as the products of these sophisticated hicks. Just your typical post-war tale of a tight nuclear family whose two kids happen to be on TV all the time. And now, Please join me in welcoming Ron Howard, Clint Howard, 
and Mary McNamara to the LA Times Book Club stage. Thank you, thank you. Take it away, Mary. Thank you, Donna. This is so exciting! Well, thank you. Uh, I can't uh, believe it! Well, uh, I'm kind of freaking out. I mean, <laughs> there's so many people, and we're out, and it's not on Zoom, and it's so exciting. Thank you for being here. I feel like, well, we're gonna have to come up with some stuff, because you kind of just got it all from the, <laughs> from the trailer. You were thinking that. I was thinking that. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's that question, right? That question. Whoa. Um, thank you so much for being here. And, and thank you both for all the wonderful things you have brought to our lives. I mean, looking at you, I am of an age where it's like, you are my life. It's, like, uh, it's really scary, actually. It's kind of like from Mayberry to, you know, Gentle Ben. I remember one of my older cousins had a Gentle Ben lunchbox that I coveted greatly. Yeah. I hope she uh, still got it. Uh, yeah, seriously. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a good question. Um, and will she give it to me? Um, and then all the way through and, you know, even now. And it's, uh, you know, and thank you very much for the paper, which remains one of my favorite. Why, thank you. <laughs> I hear I from you. We always go, that was such a good, so the whole chair thing, we still talk about that <laughs> at an actual newspaper. Um, before we start talking about your wonderful book, I do want to ask you guys as, you know, Hollywood elite, do you think we're going to have a strike? I'm like really nervous about this. Yeah, yeah. You do think we're going to have a strike? Yeah. Oh, crap. Yeah. All right, well, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. got to prep some story. I, I certainly hope not, but I, you know, I, I have a feeling there's, I mean, just from what I've gathered, there's, you know, there's a real disconnect, and that's, you know, that kind of might be the only way to resolve it. Right. And do you have any insights? Can you no. fix it, Ron Howard? I, like, <laughs> no. I feel like you might be able to. No. And, uh, and, uh, no. Get on the phone and say. <laughs> it's, uh, let's, you know, let, let's hope not. Let's hope not. Okay. And do you have anything in production? Right I, I have, uh, I have uh, two different projects in post-production, which would be affected. Okay. All right. Well, everybody say a little prayer yeah. that the producers come to their senses. <clears throat> Let's talk about The Boys. Um, I love this book so much. I love this book on like 11 different levels. One, obviously, being the story of your very miraculous career. But also, it's like it is, as you say, it's your, it's your real, it's a story of family, and it's a story of craft. You know, it's like a story of your parents handing down a craft to you, which is like just absolutely amazing. Um, you talked a little bit about the why you wrote it. Can you talk a little bit about how you wrote it? I mean, I have a brother. I wouldn't want to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, R Ron and I, uh, you know, once we got the idea to, to do a book, uh, then, of course, we had to come up sort of with a proposal. So at which point we, we sort of got together, we locked in on what we thought the rhythm of the book might be. Uh, we locked in on, on sort of... How we, might, how we might present it. Yeah, time frame, sort of the, the length of our lives that we would try to yeah. cover. And, you know, j just like writers, which we both are, you know, we started with an outline and sort of just fleshed it out. I always had a sense that, that a sort of shared narrative might, might work, although I, I couldn't recall actually reading anything. But when I tested it on, on, on people who did know, um, they, you know, they, they seemed to feel like it could work. And it really proved itself out in our in our proposal, and uh, and and it I, and also in the proposal, it, it I realized that that Clint was a secret weapon because he's funny and he writes in his voice. Now David Camp is a journalist who came in and really helped us. He's also an author himself, uh, Vanity Fair veteran, and and really incredibly helpful, interviewing us, um, reading our emails. Uh, suggesting structures, to, uh, pa handing pages back to us to rework, and, and it went back and forth. But he was great at sort of not only sort of recognizing our individual voices, but also, uh, you know, just encouraging us to just keep sort of writing and rewriting. And then Morrow. Yeah, um, the, sort of the editor. Morrow Prieto was great. Yeah. Morrow was absolutely awesome. And I had no our first experience with all of that. So. Yeah, I had no idea really, you know, what an editor was going to do. And at first, he sort of left us alone. But like a good coach, man, when it counted, just when my emotions, which this was an emotional experience for, for at least for me to write this book, and 
both both emotionally and mentally. But in the fourth quarter, man, our editor just, you know, he got in our faces. I mean, not <laughs> not literally, but in a way, he really stepped it up. And I, I really appreciate him, Mauro. And, and, and I also thought that, you know, at the beginning that it was going to be more of a solitary process. And in fact, collaborating with Ron was beautiful, but David Camp and Morrow made it a real collective team. But COVID, unfortunately, intervened. I mean, and, and you sort of, we, we, we never spent a day writing together. We couldn't. Really? Uh, I mean, well, the proposal, we, we live 3,000 miles apart. Right, right. I, I, li I live on the East Coast. And, and uh, so, you know, we did that sort of virtually back and forth, phone calls, emails, you know, sharing documents and whatnot. Um, and with the with the intention that we were gonna we were gonna get together and and and, and write, and it, you know unfortunately we just uh, we could we couldn't do that. Well, we had a beautiful advantage. Uh, um, Ron sort of had cajoled Dad um, before. Well, I don't know, ten years ten years ago, to to write legacy letters like legacy emails, and Ron couched it that he that he wanted Dad to write these letters to explain the family history to, to our children, you know, which was a great idea. And dad really loved the idea. Dad didn't want to write a book. We tried to get him to write a book. He wouldn't want to do it, but he did these legacy letters and they ended up becoming just rich resource for us as we dove into the book. Many of the stories, you know, we'd heard over the years, but he, you know, when he, you know, he gave us so much more detail. So look, the, the reality is We've both been asked all our lives, you know, what was it like to grow up on television? <laughs> uh, you know, how did you survive? And, and you know, and, and I'm talking about, you know, A-list superstars to folks you bump into at the mall. They, everybody wants to talk about this. And, um, and I, I felt, and this is why I brought it up with Clint when we were, when we were doing, preparing the memorial for, for Dad, you know, I, I never wanted to do a book on my own. I had no interest. And, and, uh, um, and, but I did recognize, look, here's a chance to sort of use our history, answer that question for readers, in, in, you know, in a really thorough, fun way. Um, and, but also um, invite people to understand our parents, if their, their sort of their, their, their love story, their, the sort of the origin story of how a family change his course, because that's what they did. We didn't do that. I don't, I, Clint said it a few times. I, I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have done it. I, I you know, I, I, I wouldn't have said, there's a horizon, I'm gonna go chase that down. That was not my nature. They did that. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to honor that, to celebrate that. And, and along the way, you know, I think it's a pretty good parenting book. I think there are a lot of object lessons. <laughs> there, are, there are some. You know, they're used to. <laughs> I love your parents. Like when I was done with reading it, it was like, it was amazing. Um, I mean, it really was the, the, not just the, you know, which many people have mentioned, the idea that they didn't take all your money, which right. many parents <laughs> of young performers are, seem to be incapable of doing. Um, but also just that they, your father taught you how to act. I mean, he literally, I mean, he, he, you have a lot of detail in there about how he, shared his method with you and he was a method actor and he like how you teach method acting to a four-year-old i'll I drop a name i'm gonna drop a name here uh, fairly early on because one of the people that i'd you know sort of asked at one point should i write a do you think i should do a memoir was tom hanks who's a good writer and 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 we're pals and i said do you think this is something i should pursue i don't really have much interest he said well one of these days you probably should but my advice would be do 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 your childhood you know, that's what's really fascinating. Uh, he's one of those A-list superstars that likes to sit around at three o'clock in the morning and ask stories about, the, you know, ask for what was it like anecdotes for, about Barney Five. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah, we're gonna need a few of those. <laughs> um, but so, so, you know, and then I told him Clint and I were joining forces on it, and he thought that was a great idea. He knows Clint well. Well, we asked him to read chapters along the way, and he did, as a good friend uh, that he is. And uh, he said, "This is great because." It's, it's not only all the fun stuff we want to know, but what your dad gave you, it is an acting primer. Mm -hmm. uh, those are great fundamentals. And it was, it was basically actor studio stuff. Right. It was Stanislavski in the most simple terms. And, and he knew how to make it digestible. But, but here's the thing. He trusted us to be able to understand at five years old 
that we could recognize that this is make-believe and yet somehow also understand that we needed to draw upon some truthful understanding of what the characters were going through, what, my, what your, our character was going through, and what the scenes were about. And he was right. And that's, you know, he, he was right to, be, to do that. And most directors don't, don't trust kids mm -hmm. to actually understand. They just want them to be performed. Well, and then he became what you call several times during the book, the child whisperer. <laughs> Even for mo movies and shows that you weren't in, it seemed like a couple of times. They kept trying to hire him. And the only the, there's one the the Monroes was a television series that recruited him, and they 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 made him a regular on the show. Right. And that they dangled that and didn't have a great part, but he was you know he, he loved being on a series, and so he he did take on that. But Clint mentioned you know that we we had suggested that he write a book, and I even said, hey dad, it's kind of low hanging fruit. Why don't you start an acting school? Everybody knows what you did for Clint and I, you know, you could, you could impart that and it's probably make a lot of money at it too. And he said, no, I don't want to write a book and I'm, I don't want to be an acting teacher. He said, I, I worked with you boys because you're, you're my sons. And I thought I had something I could, I could share with you. And it was fun because we had this in common, but I have no interest in, 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 in working with anybody else. I'm too busy trying to get jobs as an actor and a writer. He could have taught sex education, too, because he was really... <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I love. It's like you ask him these questions all through the book. There are, like, these little, you know, awkward encounters, as there are with teenage boys and girls, and it's like he just answers the question and moves on. Dad was always Amazing. remarkably straightforward with us uh, in terms of the business, but also just in terms of life. I mean, it was... I, Boy, so vividly remember going into bathrooms with him on these studio lots. And back in the days, it was a very male-dominated sort of industry. And these bathroom walls were just filled with wonderful pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, diagrams and stuff. And of course, as curious kids, you know, what is that, Dad? And Dad was very methodical. And he never BSed us. He would always give us the answer, and it would take a long time. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, well, also, too, I, it, this process of writing the book, I, I so tried to channel Dad and Mom as we were going through this process of, of you know, thinking back. See, one, one thing I had was... I had memories of me thinking about, you know, when I was, th I was thinking when I was nine years old. And now I can go back and, and analyze it and go, boy, I was thinking like an idiot, you know. But, or have a reflective moment and go, well, that was actually, for a nine-year-old, I was pretty smart. And they gave us so much confidence. I remember, have, I was, I remember being so confident as a young actor. And, you know, it wasn't self-made. That came from a great environment. Not only did I have mom and dad mentoring me and being my parents, I was five years, I'm five years younger, and I had Ron being this great role model. I watched him wade into the business, and I sort of you know, got along and, you know, behind him and rode the wave. You know, one of the things that I never obviously contemplated when I was young, and I, and I hadn't thought about it until we were working on the book, but, you know... One of the things that I think they imparted without ever really describing it was, um, um, you know, a kind of a fearlessness and a kind of a courage to, to try and fail. There was a lot of disappointment in their professional lives. And you could see it. And you could also see that because of the, the way they, they faced it, that that wasn't crushing, that, that, that didn't kill you. That was just a disappointment. And it was a separate thing than your life with the people that you loved, you know? And that was, that was powerful. And I think that it, without that, I don't think I would have had the, the sort of the, the nerve to leave acting and transition into directing, to believe that I could really do that, to face those frustrations and fears, and, and along the way, in my own way, I've tried to take creative risks. Um, because of them, and because of something that didn't wind up in the book, but uh, when I was doing a TV series with Henry Fonda, 
he he said at one point he said as a creative person in this business if you don't feel like you're risking your career every couple of years you're not really trying and you're not and you're not respecting the medium or the audience and i've i've to, in my own way tried to take that to to heart as well Were there things, I mean, memoirs can be really tricky things because you remember one thing and you think that's true and then you talk to your sibling or your parent or your friend and they're like, hell no, that's not how it happened. <laughs> yeah. um, did you guys discover things? Did you, I mean, one of the things that I really like about the book is like every once in a while, Clint will bust into your narrative or you'll bust into his narrative and like sort of, it's almost like you're reading it and then adding a little marginalia note or something. Well, the five years difference was, was really, Perfect for you know, I had a different perspective. I had a completely different perspective of the 70s that that you know than Ron had just age-wise and and you know maturity level and Yeah, we saw things different. Um, I'll tell you what I saw I saw him not getting any respect at about 16 or 17 years old when he started floating the idea that he wanted to be a filmmaker and I, you know and it was frustrating for him but I sat back and I thought, you know, my brother here, he may be 16 years old, but he's got all the chops. And at 16 years old, he could have stepped on the set of a television show and directed and been as good as anybody that I'd worked with. And, and you know, it, it's, been, it's been so beautiful for me as an adult to, to watch him grow, not only change careers, but then flourish as a director. And I've been so proud that he has kicked it in the pants. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he hires me once in a while, which is also really pleasant. That's, uh, that's the easy part, that's the easy part. The, uh, you know, I, the, um, the, the structure, the approach, was was the sort of the, the 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 shield against that ever even being a problem? It suddenly flipped it around, and it was an asset. So we recognized that that was going to be you know part of part of the fun of it. Uh, one of the things that that David Camp also did was because it was kind of awkward to go back and like interview people. You know, like Noel Salvatore, my best friend from high school, is here. He's in the book, um, and um, but. David actually got together with these Cord the Cordova Street boys, the guys that, uh, you know, <laughs> were the, my, my little gang, and, uh, and spent some time and, and came, came away with some observations that he could then bounce, you know, off of us. And he interviewed a few other people, including Henry Winkler, which was, uh, which, again, was really useful um, and, uh, uh, and, but, and would have been a little awkward for us. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that part of the book where you're discussing your... Uh, career on happy days and you go into some you know that it wasn't all as happy as the title might imply that you know as Fonzie grew as a character and you started feeling like a this is maybe not what I want to do and I certainly don't want to do it on a show that is shifting towards another character can you talk a little bit about that what that was like to sort of was that something that you had thought about before or was that so, something that sort of came out of going well, back to tell the story I'd been a bit reluctant to take to do the show but you know, it was a great job, and 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 I, I've grown up, you know, with that sense that work begets work, and you don't sort of turn your nose up at a at a at a great opportunity. It it um, it was never really that the show was shifting or that my part was changing. That wasn't ever really what bothered me. We had a great ensemble. Jerry Paris, our director, was inspired. We had this great you know, sort of, uh, you know, um, esprit de corps. Henry and I always got along great. And, and he was like, uh, you know, almost immediately became almost a big brother figure for me. He's a very inspiring guy, very intelligent and funny and loves, loves the, the, you know, the, the art of acting. So all of that was great. It, honestly, it had to do with the media and it had to do with the studio and the network and their treatment. Uh, of me, I felt suddenly disrespected, mm -hmm. and 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 that 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 sort of my value in their eyes was reduced. And look, in retrospect, it was a real quality problem, and I could even recognize that then. Tremendous to be on a number one show. I knew that, um, and but 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 it 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 was a test, 
It was a test and it was eating me up in a lot of ways because again, it wasn't exactly where I wanted to be. Right. It also fueled my ambition. So I was able to kind of convert it um, and, um, um, and I began making films again on the weekends and, 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 and doing that sort of thing. And, but it also provided opportunities, the leverage ultimately to get my first directing going. So I always knew it was a double-edged sword and it was a wonderful thing and I stayed with the show until my contract was up. And it was you know, one of the most difficult decisions of, of my uh, career was to actually leave the show when it was still going great. And these are all the people that I uh, loved, including Marion Ross, who's here, by the way. Uh, Marion. Let's see. Uh, huh. the, uh, can I tell people how she describes her age? <laughs> Who describes herself as 93 fucking years old. <laughs> 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 you are a goddess. <laughs> she is a goddess. <laughs> she great. was a real glue on the show. We were talking backstage, but she she knew to sort of look around. Gary Marshall and Marion Ross had everybody's sort of psychological ba backs and understood how to kind of sidle up and get people to get people to talk and uh, and. So in some of those frustrations, those periods where uh, you know I felt like God, my hair's falling out awfully fast. When did this start to happen? Uh, or the eczema on my eyelids and hands were kind of getting away from me. She recognized all those things and was uh, also incredibly helpful talking me through that. There's there's also a great part. Both of you address it in the book about you know how you know the, the terrible tween years when like when chi child actors become not quite adolescent, so you're not quite able to play, you know, a 20-year-old or even a high school student, because they're all 27, and, and just, like, what a trap that is for young actors. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, because that's kind of like adolescence times nine million. Well, well that's it, and it, and it feels like a, a kind of emotional betrayal. Well, yeah, adolescence is, you know, the actors, young actors don't have the market cornered on, on troubled adolescents. But the junior high school era, the junior high school period, was both, in a way, the real highlight of my life, because I, I, and also a low life. I got, I got kind of put on a television show called The Cowboys, and it was based on a John Wayne movie. And I had just been in a film called The Red Pony with Henry Fonda and Maureen O'Hara, and I just felt like my career was. My, my career was going really well, and then I got on this television series, The Cowboys, and my role was a stinker. I was the seventh of eight kids, and I was getting one line an episode, and it was draining me a little bit. I had one huge advantage, and that is in junior high school, I developed this thirst for journalism, and that was brought upon by my journalism teacher, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell, who I had in the eighth grade, and immediately loved the idea of writing. Dad had been a writer, but, but Mr. Campbell introduced me to the fourth estate and, and tight, writing a tight lead and being a good, solid journalist. And he inspired me so much. And he was by far and away the best educator I ever came close to encountering. Now, this is sort of special because I've remained friends with, with Steve Campbell over the years. And he's just absolutely a superior human being. And in fact, today is Steve Campbell's 80th birthday. And he's here tonight in the audience. <laughs> and, and, that, and that man meant so much to me. And over the years, our relationship has, has, has you know, it's changed. It's grown, it's, it's, it's grown stronger, though. And I just love, I love you, Steve. And, and I, you, you, you are a great teacher, and you're a better friend. Uh -huh. but, Let's hear it for the journalism teachers. Yeah. Uh, but, oh. I, you know, in talking about the, the, you know, that sort of that period of time, I think in some ways I might have even felt it more than Clint did because, you know, 
the Andy Griffith Show had been gone out as a number one show. I was 14 years old. And, you know, I continued to work. And I, you know, I barely, barely ever even had to audition. And when I did, I always got the part. And suddenly, that just changed. Like, right. 50, you know, 18 months later, two years later. And I went for a stretch where I didn't work for, I don't know, a long time, nine months, 10 months. Uh, and and I, it, it was really destabilizing. And that coming along with sort of adolescence with all of those insecurities was, uh, you know, I, 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 again, I was able to convert that into a kind of focused ambition, a kind of a, and I, again, I think I, I recognize this in my dad, a sort of a, you know, it, it doesn't have to be easy. If it was easy, everybody could do it. Um, dig down, and if you love it, chase it. We're restaging backdraft for you. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we need them. Go. We need them. Let's not begrudge them this siren. <laughs> Eat my dust will be coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I do, I know I'm conducting this interview completely back asward, but I do want to talk a little bit about when you were kids uh, and child actors, and I do want to hear the Barney Fife stories. Um, <laughs> but one thing I do, I really, I want to clarify that your parents were introduced to each other by Dennis Weaver mm. yeah. at the University of Oklahoma, ladies and gentlemen, and then you ended up co-starring with Dennis Weaver. Like, that is some serious like Midwest juju, that like, I don't even know what was sacrificed for that to happen. Well, Dennis was an upperclassman at OU, and, and uh, mom and dad were, were underclassmen, and, and Dennis was running a scene study class, and uh, he paired mom and dad with each other one day to do a scene together, and, uh, you know, the sparks flew. And, you know, the, the fact that we circled back and Dennis got to play my dad, uh, was just, you know, was, yeah, if we wrote it in a movie, no one would believe it. Dad, Dad always said that Mom was the, the, the best actor at OU when he was there. Um, that everyone, you know, ex expected great things of her. And um, she proved that right much later, but the, the business really, really punched her in the gut. It, she just, she went on audition after audition and just was not getting work. Um, and, you know, they, once she, once she and dad were married, um, she threw herself into being the person who could always get a job, which she could. Um, you know, she typed 115 words a minute or whatever it was, and then she was in the typing pool at CBS. But she could, she was just one of these people that could, you know, well, as Clint always says, she could make, make friends in an elevator in two floors. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but later in life after we were after we were raised and out of the house yeah. empty nest i mean it really was an empty nest situation she did other jobs she helped a friend with a business she did a, she cast extras for tv movies and things like that and slowly but surely she started to inch her way back into it henry winkler cast her in a nice role uh in a dolly parton christmas movie that he was directing um, and she'd been in a couple of, a couple, she had a nice little small part in Cocoon. She s sort of began to find her way into it. And then she went out there and she was, then went 0 for 100 on auditions. She was experiencing the whole nightmare all over again. And, and this time she said, you know, I don't, I don't care anymore. It's just fun for me. I don't need the money. I don't, I don't even need the job for any reason. But you know what else she did? She, 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 she entered a, a cold reading workshop. She back, went back to scene study. She started sending out postcards with herself in these funny little granny poses, you know, and, and. It's a, it's a tribute to mom, the title, because that's what she always called all the three of us. And so that, that's, uh -huh. uh, hence the title. It was, so, it was so beautiful. I would go on auditions. I still go on auditions, you know, but I would be going around the, the, the audition circuit here in LA. And every once in a while, I would see one of those postcards <laughs> that mom had created 
tacked up on a casting director's bulletin board. And, you know, they loved Mom, and, and Mom loved the business, and Mom always used to say that, you know, the audition process is really the work, and she loved doing it, and getting the job was just icing on the cake. Mom had such an incredibly beautiful attitude towards the business, uh, you know. I, she, she, said, uh, she said a great thing that this, this didn't wind up in the book, but, but when my oldest daughter, Bryce, began showing interest, and I have another acting daughter, Paige, that I suspected was, was <laughs> going, to, going to be interested. And, and I, I, you know, I realized they had talent, and, and uh, um, we, Cheryl and I wouldn't allow them to work professionally as, as kids. But I, I actually went to mom, and I said, you know, I, it's much harder. It's a much harder business for women than it is for men. I'm, I'm a little terrified. Should I be just dissuading them? I, you know, I, we, moved to, we moved back east. We moved to Connecticut so that they wouldn't feel like they were sort of inculcated into the world. And she said, no, you can't discourage them. You cannot do that. She said, look, when Rance and I were doing summer stock together, I, I've, I've kept up with everybody. You know, of the 30 people that were in a company, you know, only four of us stayed with it. The rest found other things to do with it. But I'm telling you, not, not a single person um, regrets having chased the dream. And if, if you try to subvert that, uh, that, that, that dream, you're, this is, that's not good parenting. Uh, and, the, the, and, you know, and, and uh, I followed her advice. I'm glad I did. Can you, can you tell the Apollo 13 story, though? I've, I've, I've yeah. heard you tell it before, and it's in the book. It's a wonderful uh, story. Well, I, I love working with Clint. I love working with Dad whenever I could. Um, neither of them ever hustled me for a gig. Nobody ever said it got anything for me. Now, you know, if, if I cast them, I cast them. If I had something, great. And, and it just, that was just the way it worked. But I was getting ready to do Apollo 13, and there, a new John Sayles had come in and done a terrific rewrite. Um, and, um, and my dad read the rewrite. He, I, he, I always asked him to read scripts, and um, right up to the end, he always could give me great notes. Um, and uh, um, but so he read the script, um, and he already knew he was gonna play a part. Mostly it was cut out. That's a great conversation to have with your dad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but he experienced that a couple of times along the way. It was never because he didn't do a good job, but sometimes that happens. But <clears throat> he called me up and he said, uh, can I talk to you about your casting? And I, I, uh, and I wondered if he spotted a bigger part for himself or something. Uh, <laughs> I said, sure. He said, well, in this rewrite, there's a really nice little part all of a sudden for Jim Lovell's mother. And... Um, and I said, yeah. And he said, your mother would knock that out of the park. Now, mom hadn't done all that much yet. She, she was back. She was, she, was, she, was, she was getting some work. And, and, um, and, I, and it was a very important role, even though it was just two or three scenes. And I said, well, I don't know, Dad. I don't know. I, I, let me think about it. And then I called and I said, you know, Dad, for a role like this, I, this is a big movie. It's a big movie for me. It's a big movie for Imagine. You know, I'd have to audition her. <laughs> and he said, fine. She'd love that. So, so I went over to their house. Didn't ask her to come into my office. <laughs> just sit over here on the couch for an hour and a half and <laughs> see you when we get a minute. Uh, so I, I went over there, and she, she read it, and it was, I was so relieved because she was instantly understood it and was, you know, tr and she did nail it. She just had it. But she, she looked too young. This is supposed, she's supposed to be in a nursing home, this mother. And, and I said, Mom, I'm just a little worried, you know, that frankly, you know, you're, you're 10 or 15 years too young for this. And Dad said, well, there's makeup and you can, you know, she already has the gray hair, we can play on, you know, I'm sure that they can work on that. And I said, yeah, I guess we could try some tests. Then Mom leaned away. She came back with her teeth out. <laughs> she said, do you think this will help? <laughs> 
<laughs> I said, you got it. You're cast. You're in. And she was great. She was great in it. And, and when she said to, to Neil Armstrong, are you with the space program too? <laughs> Just, I mean, she knocked it out of the park in that picture, you yeah, know. So. so everybody was in. You were in it. And you was your oh, dad yeah. in it? Oh, yeah, he had a good part. And yeah. your dad was in it? Yes, yep. yes, he That's played amazing. a minister. That's yep. amazing. Um, we are going to get back, <laughs> we'll keep saying, let's talk about the, the young years, and then we go somewhere else. But let's talk about the young years um, just really briefly. Um, I have to say the, the Red Pony, when I told my husband I was interviewing, and I said, oh, he was in the Red Pony, and, like, my husband started to cry <laughs> just from the movie. And there's just this, you have this anecdote in there about the buzzard, about, like, yeah. that's just, like, insane. Can you tell that story? Yes, well, in the film, um, that, that, that there was a scene where I, the colt dies, and I kind of rush down to this ravine, and I see the colt, and he's laying in this stream, and the buzzards are, are on the colt. And um, the scene is written to where Jody grabs one of these buzzards and, and, and to get him off the, the colt, kills the buzzard. And I, at first, I assumed that it was going to be some sort of, you know, puppet, or not a puppet, but a dummy bird. And the director, Bob Totten, and this would never be done today at all. But somehow, Bob Totten had it in his head that we were going to, I was going to take out a real buzzard. And they, somehow they got the uh, Humane Society guy off the set. And it bothered me at the time because, listen, I had worked with animals. I'd been in Gentle Bend, raccoons and the bear and all sorts of critters. And, and, and I was being asked to end this buzzard's life. And, you know, Dad and I had a long talk about it. And, you know, the, the whole idea of the, the food chain and, and they, they assured me that this buzzard was going to be food for other animals and stuff, and, and I was right in the middle of making this movie, and it was, you know, I knew it was an, an important thing for me to do, or so I thought, and, and by God, you know, um, they put a flat rock out there in the stream, and when the time was right, and then, you know, Bob called action, I raced down, I grabbed this buzzard, and I, I beat him, and I killed him, and I thank God, I, you know, it only took a couple of whacks, you know, because I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to do it. And, and I, I did this deed, and I'm not, I'm not real proud of it. And like I wrote in the book, you know, I love that movie. And for me, it was the highlight of my uh, juvenile career. And yet that scene, it's hard for me to watch because, you know, that poor buzzard didn't deserve it that day. And, you know, I don't know, uh, hopefully God uh, gives me a pass on that one. How old were you? You were just a child. It's like, I was, I think I turned 13 years old at the time. That's like, that's just, I mean, that, that just blew my well, mind. It's like, if anybody thinks that being a kid actor is easy. Yeah. Just well, it's that. one of the fascinating things, um, which I, you know, I just, again, I don't look back all that much, but it was really interesting to recognize the cultural shifts within our business. Um, sensibilities. Uh, not just our business, but the, the, right. the, the way in which change has reflected itself within the business. I am so grateful for it. I don't look back on that aspect of it with one bit of nostalgia. It was toxic masculinity. It was, um, you know, rules like that being overlooked. Um, and uh, and I'm, 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 I'm so grateful that we've, that we've, you know, that we have and are struggling to, to, to to work through that and grow and, and grow out of that. But it's also interesting to recognize how little the process has changed in its purest form. It is about connecting ideas and themes using entertainment values, genre discipline, um, to convey these ideas to an audience in a, in a memorable way. And it boils down to, you know, um, actors that writers writing, actors acting, directors right. directing, and trying to that creative problem solving, and that fuels me to this day. It excited me as a little kid. You could feel the energy. It was palpable, and it's really what I, I live for. I love I love it as a collaboration because it, it just continues to be great. When I was doing 
uh, Cocoon, uh, which was, when did we shoot? 84, 83, 84. Um, the, uh, we were there in St. Petersburg, Florida. There was one small speaking part that uh, we hoped to find locally. And we did, we found a guy, I can't remember his last name, Charlie. He was 96 years old. Charlie was still driving a car. And, um, and, and Charlie, who had been too old to serve in World War I, um, <laughs> had, had at one time been an actor. And I said, well, when was this? And he said, well, it was before movies left New Jersey. <laughs> and, and there had been a thriving business in New York and New Jersey, and then it, you know, it sort of went first to Arizona and then to California. And um, he just didn't want to move west. So he became a salesman, and, and that's what he did. So we're sitting around, and Charlie did fine. You know, he had a few lines, and, and he was terrific. And, and I was talking to him, and I said, well, Charlie, this must have really, really changed. He said, nah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of the same old bullshit. Hurry up and wait. <laughs> he said. He said that. He said the only difference is that, that you know now, now you got to shut up when you roll the cameras. In the old days, we didn't have to stop the card game. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, but uh, you know so the you know I I do get sort of excited by the fact that it probably hasn't changed ever. You know once people started trying to put on productions to convey an idea. I think I think that same process of discovery and and um, and sharing with an audience has always existed, and it continues to excite me. I think one of the things that's so wonderful about the parts uh, where where you guys are writing about um, the Andy Griffith Show and Gentle Ben is that it's described, you describe it as children, because you experience it as children. So like there's this wonderful bit about all the sweaty people that you've had to deal with, like yeah. how much Johnny Cash sweat. I mean, like you've been sweat on by some of the great. Yeah. It's like, I was like, when I was getting ready, I'm going, well, I, will I sweat? I don't know. Ron Howard seems to really notice that. But I mean, it's not just that, but it's just kind of like the kid's eye view of like what was happening. So how, when you went back, I mean, with the bear and the story of the raccoon running up your front, I mean, that's just like, but, and, and the way the bear smelled and like having to deal with that. When you, was that all there when you went back to write it or did you, did you watch some of the stuff and like go, oh, I remember what that was like or? Oh no, the experiences are all still. Still very vivid. Pretty darn vivid in my mind, you know, and the sweat, the, the heat. The heat, and Ron described it really well in his experiences on, on uh, The Music Man, but the reflectors, they, and for the Westerns that they would shoot, Bonanza and Gunsmoke, they would just put a bank of those hot reflectors and just zero them in like, you know, magnifying glass in the sun with ants. And like Ron said, you know, when it got really hot on your face and you couldn't hardly open your eyes, you were in your light. And they loved it. And then, of course, the last thing the director would say is after you were be being blasted with this heat and this light is, open your eyes, Clint. You're squinting. <laughs> yeah, I'm squinting. I can't see. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit of On the Music Man? You write very vividly about the heat and, like, the makeup, sweat. I mean, I love the Music Man. Thank you very much oh, well, for yeah. being part of it. It was fun the to be part of it. Like, and I'm glad Robert, I always, I've never met Robert Preston, but it sounds like he was as wonderful as I think he is, was. Yeah, no, he, he was great. I can't say that I got to know him very well. I had a few scenes with him and right. he was very, you know, very, very busy. And it, it, that was a huge, uh, you know, a huge production, but it was, you know, it was awesome and it was very friendly and fun and kid friendly because it was just a great show and you got to see these dancers kind of, you know, do, you know, applying their, their, their talent in remarkable ways. There were a lot of kids on that production, too. Right. So, so that was a lot of fun for me at the time. Can you talk about, though, you, you write about the costume and then you write Itchy. about the not being able they to They wanted dance. to wear these, these wool stockings, you know, and the short pants. And I wasn't used to any of that. And these shoes that took forever to buckle up. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, that was really, uh, you know, all of that was really a, a <laughs> really a drag. But it was a, but it was a, you know, it was it was a really fun production to be around. I think they cast me because they thought it was cute that I couldn't really sing. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, but uh, I'm now working on my first uh, musical as a director. 
It's an animated film, um, and can't really say too much about it because it hasn't been fully announced. But it's it's really great to be working suddenly on these, you know, in a, in a, in a new a new genre. And I'm always and you will, always you will not be singing on. I won't sing a <laughs> syllable. I'm, no, no. Uh, um, I'm going to ask one more question because then we're going to we have some questions from the audience. But one thing that I wondered as I was reading this, I mean, it's so much a very specific time. I mean, really, it's sort of like the arc into mo what we know as modern television, modern film, and modern fame. And I mean, it was sounds like it was hard enough on you guys, you know, getting teased for being called Opie or being asked, where's your bear, or whatever. But what do you think, I mean, do you think you could have had the career, careers that you had then, now, given like the social media and the constant, you mean, the press, I mean, you know. Well, it's different because um, television was so dominant then that if you were on a number one show, whether it was the Andy Griffith show or Happy Days, it was it was it was it, it was you, you were in you were leading the zeitgeist. You were you you know you were on the vanguard right. of popular culture. If 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 you were on a successful show, which meant you were far more recognizable. You know when 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 Happy Days really broke through and Fonz D Mania kicked in the way it did, it was it was it was like being in a boy band or something. You know it just about doesn't happen. With television shows um, or movies mm -hmm. uh, anymore, um, it, it's part of what's exciting about the world today. Creatively, uh, is that you you know you can very successfully um, target audiences, write and, and and create and direct you know for that audience. Less of a sort of a middle of the road kind of an approach. And so outside of maybe the giant tentpole movies and a couple of TV shows that will break through. You know, that kind of thing doesn't happen. I think our parents would have helped us navigate that. I think they would have understood what social media was all about. And, and in a very logical way, you, were, you, you know, Clint was talking about it. You were talking about it. Dad didn't tiptoe around subjects. He didn't think there was anything uncomfortable about the truth. And he would be very pragmatic about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And he probably would say, you know, if you go off and get yourself in some kind of a trouble, somebody's going to have a camera and blah blah blah. And you, you know, and then you'd and you you you'd navigate that. And are you like that with your? With well, your I well they're you know they're they're, they're smarter than I am, and about, <laughs> especially about about social media and whatnot. I I, I, I go to Bryce for advice. You didn't want them to be child. child. You didn't want them to perform when they. Were no, children. because um, for for two for a couple of reasons. For, first and foremost, we have four kids. And I was incredibly busy, not only directing, but also as you know, co-founder of Imagine Entertainment. So throughout their entire lives, I, I've I've been on a you know on a very very demanding schedule. Cheryl is it was a AFI writing fellow and continued her writing along the way. So we were both very very busy. We didn't have time to do what I knew that it took to be a great parent to a child performer and actor. Mm -hmm. we, we couldn't devote that kind of time to one child. Mm -hmm. And so we recognized that. Also, I felt like um, it would be unfair. By, by the time they came along, you know, uh, Opie as a character was, it was like Shirley Temple or something. It was kind of, it was mythologized. And, and I, I felt like there was, there were, you know, there was just no reason to expose a kid to that kind of comparison, mm -hmm. um, no matter how great they might be. And uh, so our our approach was, um, you know, when when you're when you're 18, if you want to pursue it professionally, great. In the meantime, do everything that you want to do as a student, and we'll you know we'll support that, which we which we did. And and it was easy to see early on with both kids, but especially with Bryce, this was encouraging. Not only did she have talent, you could see by the time she was in ninth grade that it was you know it's like when you see a great high school athlete and you realize well that person could be a pro she you know she was already there but but the other thing is she 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 didn't care about opening night and getting the roses on stage that the parents brought up or whatever she she liked rehearsals she liked the process she didn't want the show she didn't want that to ever end and um, she still feels that way now she's working behind the camera as well as in front of it and that's what she still continues to you know to, to fuel her what do you think about the social media thing and how it would have affected? I, well, I just have a, a quiet confidence that mom and dad would have helped us navigate. Uh, it mm -hmm. is incredibly complicated because the social media 
which means basically everybody's got their own ability to have a newsletter, you know, and then comment on everybody's newsletter. And it's just this massive amount of information that it's more, nowadays it's more about fame and notoriety. And it, when we were growing up, job by job, it was about getting the role and then doing it to the best of your ability in an old school kind of craftsman way, um, knowing that, that we both were doing an adult job and that we had a responsibility to do our very best. And I think today, listen, when I'm on sets now, people are just at their phones, you know, logging into Instagram and stuff. And instead of having, instead of having their mind on the job at hand, which is creating a character, and, and doing that, I, you know, um, although I must admit, every once in a while, I just, I just finished working on a, a, a movie called The Old Way, a, a Nicolas Cage movie, that, um, you know, I was, it was a Western, you know, it was a Western, and I played an old Civil War veteran, and I had my cell phone in my pocket, so, <laughs> you know. Hypocrite. Yeah, I know, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. <laughs> okay, so we have questions from the audience. Do we have questions from the audience? Well, I think we have, oh, here we go. We're not doing, we have, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, all of you shared, but first, I just want to thank our guests for that wonderful Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who shared their questions, and I'm, we can't ask them all, but I'm going to pull out a few for our guests. Um, our first question comes from uh, someone in the audience, uh, she sent this ahead of time by email, um, named Patsy. And she talks about how she truly enjoyed watching the Andy Griffith show during the pandemic and said it was really good therapy for her. So she says, thank you very much. Um, she shares her favorite episode, and I'll tell you what that is. But first, um, did you have a favorite episode from the Andy Griffith show, and why? Uh, well, there are a couple of episodes that people really... Uh, you know, that re resonate with people. And a lot of the Opie episodes were dramedies. You know, they, they, they weren't all, you know, rarely the broad, zany episodes. Um, and uh, so there, you know, one, Opie the Birdman is well regarded. Yeah. And, and, I, and that's the one where I really, and I write about this in the book, mm -hmm. where I really, really cried on screen for the first time. And I felt it and understood it. And my dad helped me get to that emotional place. And it was sort of a rite of passage among, among the other actors, and I'll, I'll never forget that. But my favorite episode was actually one that my dad wrote the story for. Um, and it was based on, a, on an event. It was a Little League game. And in the game, uh, Opie you know, tries to score and is called out at home by Andy the umpire. And Opie feels like that that was wrong and, and a terrible call and is very upset. And that had actually happened to me at a birthday party <laughs> where I thought I had hit the, on my birthday, the game-winning Grand Slam home run, and Dad called me out at the plate. Um, he was wrong. Oh, he blew man. the call. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that hey, happened. Hey, hey. But he, he wound up uh, writing that story, and then somebody else wrote, wrote the, the screenplay. So that remains my, my favorite episode. Okay, I well, he, here's Patsy's episode. I'm sorry, I gotta get Patsy's episode yeah, in here. Um, she said her favorite episode is the early one about the slingshot, Mama Bird, and Opie caring for the babies, being ready to be released. Well, that is Opie the Birdman. That's, that's, that's the Birdman that, 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 that you brought up. So yeah, yeah. you both have the same one. Sorry, Mary, go ahead. I just wanted to say, you, you talk in the book, and I think Clint does, about like that you guys took pride and that you didn't use the glycerin tears, that you, Howard Boyd cried real tears. Yeah, I, Clint stayed with that. I, at a certain point, I shut that down. Oh, really? There was a certain point where I was, I was as a young adolescent, I was, I was too embarrassed. And I honestly just, I, it, was, it was like, I'm not gonna give them that. And, uh, and, and so they, in fact, I, I'm sure this isn't allowed now, the ammonia capsules. Yeah. They, right. they, they, they we, would give us these ammonia capsules, which you take this horrible hit, and, uh, and then your eyes would start to wa water. And if you were in an emotional space, which I could get to, I, I just didn't want to feel the burden of having to generate that and go to the place where I would, where I would um, you know, give, give that up. It was just a kind of a male adolescent, you know, uh, pride thing. 
Well, thank you. Uh, okay, so our next two questions are similar, so I'm going to ask them, and they're for you both. I'm going to ask them both together because they're similar to Ron. Well, the first one is from Kara, uh, and she, she asks both of you, have you ever wanted to leave the business? And the second uh, question, uh, and this member of the audience didn't put their name, but uh, their question is, did you ever consider rebelling and not pursuing acting as a career? So, um, Clint, maybe you start with us with that. Well, listen, yes, frustration, yes. Uh, for some reason, God gave me a Teflon psyche. And, you know, throughout my childhood going on auditions, I, I was much more of a freelance actor than Ron was, and I would compete a lot. And, yeah, it would piss me off. But, listen, I, I loved the process, and I loved acting, and I loved being around the people. So, you know, listen, psyche, I would dust myself off and get back in there. And in terms of rebellion, the closest thing I ever had is in junior high school with Mr. Campbell. I really considered, um, like, zoning in and being a sports writer. I thought that possibly I might just pitch the idea of acting and be a sports writer. The problem is I did a little research and I saw that sports writers at the time, they hit a glass ceiling awfully quickly. And, you know, listen, I'm, I'm a practical man and, you know, I'm, I'm not an <laughs> amateur anymore. I gave up my amateur status 59 years ago. So as a professional, I thought, well, listen, you know, I love the business. I like what it does for me and I like the fact that I can make some money at it. And, and no, I've never considered really rebelling and, 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 and telling the business stuff I call. I, uh, I never, I, I always wanted to do it. I loved it. I always loved it. And I, I think that's another reason why I was able to navigate it emotionally because I, I wasn't looking for a reason to stop doing it. I, I, um, it, was, it, it, it was very frustrating when I began to hit limitations and walls, but, uh, but I did recognize early on that I really wanted to be behind the camera. I really did not, I, I, I enjoyed acting, I enjoyed being a part of it, but I, even then I felt a little limited. And as I began to love movies and really watch it, I, I felt like I had, a, I had a chance to be better as a filmmaker than I could ever be as an actor. Um, and I, 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 really, uh, I really wanted that. I talk about this in the book, but when we were doing the very first Happy Days pilot, uh, when it was a spinoff of, uh, of uh, uh, Love American Style, right. I actually had the envelope and, uh, where I was accepted to USC as a cinema major. And, uh, and I opened it, and the first person I showed it to was Marion, who was there playing my mom in that first pilot. Oh, wow. and, uh, and, and so even then, at 17, you know, my... My, uh, that, that, was, that, was my, that was my dream. My idea of rebellion was to not fulfill people's cliched sense of who I should be because I was an actor. Mm -hmm. What kind of car I should drive, what kind of parties I should go to, and, that's, and that, was, that was really it. I just chose not to, not to live up to their, you know, their, their um, the cliched sense of what it, what it speaking was. So, of uh, cars, speaking of cars, and this shows you how high living Ron and I were. His first car was a Volkswagen Be uh, Beetle. And my first car was an AMC Pacer. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go back to something you just said that when you, um, you know, figuring out should you go to USC, that's going to resonate with a lot of folks here. And, and your TV mom, you asked her from, for some advice. Um, what advice did Marion give you? Uh, um. She, she was just always so supportive. I mean, she, she 100%, it made sense to her. She knew I'd grown up, you know, in the business. And she and Henry Winkler were always the two people on the show who were always saying, you chase your dream, you go for it. Um, and, um, you know, on the day when I left the show, and I wrote about this as well, I called the set, and I did, I talked to, I talked to Gary Marshall, and I talked to Henry. Henry was kind of representing the cast. And... Uh, and, and Henry said, you're going to be great. We're going to miss you. We'd go with God. And, uh, and, you know, I always felt that from everybody on the cast. They, I, look, I must have driven them crazy. I mean, <laughs> I, I had already directed Marion, and then I was doing shorts with Donnie Most, and uh, talking to Anson Williams had ideas. And it was, but, but I was just nonstop with this whole directing thing. I mean, I, I must have been a real pain in the ass. <laughs> 
True? <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next question um, is, again, for both brothers. What experience did you share as brothers that most helped create the special bond that you have today? Sports. Yeah, sports. Sports. My, my first memory is, is waking up in the morning. I must have been three years old, so making him eight. He had learned how to read. He would get up early. He would feed the cat, go get the LA Times paper. Woo! Bring it into the hallway where there was a floor heater, lay down and start reading the sports section. And I would climb on my brother's back. And, and I would, I would, he would regale me with stories about Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax, and he'd read the box score. Tommy Davis got two hits. And, and I still, honest to God, I still remember the warmth of being on his back and having him teach me about baseball. And we've all... <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, baseball was, is such a beautiful game, and... You know, we 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 share that. We still share about it. We still share. And, yeah, go uh, Dodgers. Go Dodgers. Uh, yeah. The, uh, uh, I live in the East, but I'm still a Dodger fan. <laughs> the uh, you know, and later, um, I mean, so playing and and you know, Clint was had has great hand-eye coordination, and from an early age, he was good enough that he could play in our wiffle ball games, and he could play, you know, in those and and the. And my friends would sort of let him join, and he was just good enough to hang in there and be a part of it. And, and so, you know, he became a really good young uh, athlete. I then started coaching um, and um, loved coaching, loved coaching kids' sports. And I coached this team. It's in the book, uh, Howard's Hurricanes, a basketball team for, what, five or six years. And it was all Clint and his buddies. It was kind of a bad news bears scenario. Hey, uh, hey, hey. <laughs> well, he was good. <laughs> it's a, uh, he... OK, uh, one more here. Uh, and this one is for Ron. Did you learn basics from your earliest directors that you still use in your work today? Definitely. I, I learned so much from some. A ha there were a handful of directors that I really, really followed. And one of them was Jerry Paris. Different tone than most of the films that I've done. Uh, but, I mean, Night Shift and Splash would not have worked the way they had if I had not had the tutelage of a guy like Jerry Paris. Mm -hmm. But brilliant staging for comedy or drama. He just knew how to move actors and, 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 and work with moments within scenes physically, um, connecting movement with an attitude. He was really a great director, really brilliant. Bob Totten that Clint referenced. I learned a lot from him, and he was really the first director to look me in the eye at age 15 and say, you say you want to be a filmmaker. What, what, what have you written lately? What have you shot? What have you edited together? Get with it. He thought I could do it, but I had to get out and, by God, do it. Um, he was very important. I learned a lot from George Lucas on graffiti, not because he spoke much, because he was very introverted at that time and didn't talk much, but when I saw the film and I recognized his attention to detail, I began to understand what cinema, the difference between cinema and what I had sort of experienced in, 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 in movies. And, um, you know, and I learned a lot from my dad, who never directed anything that was ever filmed, but directed a lot of theater. And I, and I used to, um, to um, spend time with him. And, you know, so the, the list went on. I asked a lot of questions. Um, I used to take a notebook and watch the way directors like Don Siegel on The Shootist um, and uh, 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 Richard Fleischer on a movie I did with him, really experienced, you know, um, uh, filmmakers, the way they staged, where they put the camera. I would ask them why, why that shot, uh, why that lens. They were very forthcoming. It was, I, I'm very grateful for that. Well, one of the questions we always ask at our book club is we always like to know uh, what our guests are reading. And I, so I was delighted uh, before our discussion tonight when Clint volunteered that he had recently uh, read a book he loved. So I'm going to throw our question to you. Aside, everyone's reading The Boys. But uh, when you're <laughs> done with The Boys, um, what else um, book do you recommend? Well, there's a, a friend of mine, a business an acting friend of mine uh, who uh, has has had the most interesting life in the world, and he wrote a book that is so riveting. 
and it's, it's Danny Trejo. And he wrote a book called Trejo, and it's about his journey from, from being a juvenile delinquent into the prison system, and then by God, with the grace of God, he ended up in show business and, and, and has lived a, a beautifully clean life for now, I don't know, 40-something years. So I would certainly, I found it a page turn. My wife, Kat, and I, who both know Danny, um, we, we, it's a page turner, and I certainly recommend, especially if there is recovery in, in anyone, any of your family members, I certainly would, would read Trejo because it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. Ron, how about you? Um, I, I am revisiting a book, actually, right now. Um, that I read, I don't know, maybe 12, 10, 12 years ago. It's a history written by William Manchester, best known for Winston Churchill, uh, uh, trilogy and Churchill. It's called A World Lit Only by Fire. And it's a really wonderful book. It's history in a very digestible um, way. Uh, he really brings it to life. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, it's, 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 it's about the birth of the Renaissance. And, um, uh, and he... He looks at it from several different vantage points. Medici family, Magellan, Henry VIII, um, um, and, um, and, and Martin Luther. It's really fascinating. Great writing, great writer, of course, but also what, what a remarkable time. And the reason I'm rereading it again is, you know, we're going through, we're going through a revolution. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's information and technology, but, <clears throat> you know, a lot, of, a lot of what we feel, that, that, that sort of that, destabilization, um, uh, you know, human beings live through that every so often. And, you know, we, we are going through something that's as, every bit as profound as the Industrial Revolution or the Renaissance. Thank you so much. Of course, Mary is one of the best read people I know, and I always love having her at a book club because she always has such great suggestions. So, Mary, will you jump in? I will, but I need to ask a question first. I'm sorry. You need to talk to me about the snow globe. This is one of your snow globes. Yes. Clint makes snow globes on top of everything else, which I forgot to ask about. And this is a snow globe from Star Trek. This is your Star Trek Yes, snow that's globe. Commander Baylock and his puppet. Okay. And uh, that's, um, it, that was actually the very first snow globe that I made. And, and, that is uh, amazing. Yes, and I've made, I think I've made 26 snow globes since. And the, uh, I don't know about, 12 snow globes in, I was having a conversation with the fellow who's, who sells me the kits. They come with a kit. It's, you know, do-it-yourself deal. And he goes, Clint, I, I just want to let you know that, you know, you're on snow globe number 12 now, and I've never had anybody buy more than two. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I, I, I want to introduce you to my 21st century obsession right there. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, thank you for asking that question. I don't know how we almost missed it. I was just like, if you introduce a snow globe in the first act, it must go <laughs> on in the third act. And I, I titled them all, and of course this one's titled, but first, the Tranya. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even get to the Tranya. Okay, too All right, so tell us what Tranya is, come on. Well, Although well, everyone who knows that episode, but tell us what Tranya is. Yeah, Tranya was the, 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 elixir, the elixir that I offered Captain Kirk and his crew aboard the Fisarius when they came when they came to me and I was just sort of playing a game with them and in fact I just wanted company and uh, I really wanted a drinking buddy uh, so <laughs> I offered Tranya uh, to the crew of, of the Enterprise and in real life it was oh in real life it was pink grapefruit juice out of a can <laughs> so much for the magic of Hollywood <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, Mary, what are you reading? I am. I, I most recently read *The Dutch House* by Ann Patchett, which, which is, is wonderful. Very good. And I should mention um, that Ann Patchett is coming to book club on December 9th. So. And she did not pay me. I did <laughs> not. Pay me, so. Yes, she did. And the other is, um, I don't know if you've listened to the audio edition of *The Dutch House*, but it's read by Tom Hanks, and the book oh, is great. Oh, the right, audio right. edition is. Wow. Um, well. I've made my husband uh, listen to it. I think he's listening to it now and loving it. He's in the audience, so it's really good. Um, I thought she'd be proud that I had read it with my own little eyes, but she kept saying, no, you need the audio. Well, all right. Okay, Tom Hanks. The book is great, too. I, I did read that. I did read it. I read it be sure and say that when Anne is here. Yeah, it's Your fabulous. Your book's good, too. 
Um, well, I want to thank you both for this wonderful conversation. Oh, this we have had, um, for our events, we always partner with uh, booksellers. And uh, for this event of Roman's Books, uh, books Locally was our independent bookseller. Awesome. And all of you got yeah. included books from with your ticket. Uh, for our virtual event this evening, uh, we also um, partnered with the Magic City Bookstore in Oklahoma. Oh, fantastic. And Barnes and Noble. So um, we had quite a few uh, booksellers. And um, so I just wanted to mention those and thank them for fulfilling it. I already heard people got their books uh, very early ahead of it. Many people did. So, And then, of course, our guests here all got them tonight. Um, as we wrap up, I always like to give our guests the last word before we end, uh, if there's anything they want to say. So, Mary, last word. Oh. Thank you very much. This is, I mean, I could talk to you guys all, all night long, and thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. First of all, I hope you enjoy the book. Uh, tell your friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been, since the moment we really sort of got serious about, about putting together the proposal, I had a feeling that, that it was going to work as a book. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, William Moore has been great, great to work with. And, but I've been looking forward to this week that we've just had, which is Clint and I together, um, and um, you know, getting to talk about this book. And I think it's, uh, I like to think it's, 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 what, it's what mom and dad would, would have loved to have seen, which is the, the two of us you know, with a reason to, um, you know, to, to, to get out into the world together and, and, and talk about our lives. So uh, you know, thank you for, for uh, being a big part of that. We've really been looking forward to it. And I, too, want to, want to thank you guys. You know, listen, without an audience, we're nothing, you know? And, and also, too, mom and dad, again, it, um, boy, oh, boy, what, what, what gifts they, they bestowed on both of us and, and, and me and, and the gentle and kindness that they, they gave me. It was, you know, unparalleled. But also, I want to make one more little pitch. You know, Tom Hanks reading an audio book. Uh-uh. Ron and I read this one. Yeah. <laughs> and and I've heard I've heard some of his, and I know I heard all of mine. And uh, and and I you know I, I think it's effective, and it is you know we uh, we're, we're listen we got to admit it, bud. We're we're kind of unique creatures. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I hope you guys enjoy, and and you know God bless you all. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you for coming out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron Howard. Thank you, Clint Howard. And thank you, Mary McNamara. And good night to our book club readers. Thank you. Mary, you guys have...